And we're live. You're full of dirts. Lineouts, episode 21 with Chris Cracknell. After some, you know, some technical difficulties, we got worked out. We are we are here on a Monday for the double header. I don't usually try to do these, but we're good to go. So, Chris, you you are a knight of some kind. You have the, uh, yeah. <laughs> you have the Order of Fiji. Uh, official uh, uh, officer of Fiji, of Fiji, yeah. So very, very lucky to have that title, yeah. So, so when did you begin playing rugby? But, you know. <laughs> hey, I, I, I don't have, you know, any knighthood behind my name, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> so rugby, when did you begin playing this lovely sport? Um, rugby was introduced to me at uh, a club called Maidenhead, uh, which is where I'm from, where I grew up. Um, I was playing at sort of sports at school, and a couple of the guys I was playing with were like, look, we, we play at the local rugby club, do you fancy it? Um, and I just happened to be the big kid in the class, and, and, that, and that was it. Really. That's how it all got started, and I went down there for, for my entire sort of junior rugby career, all the way through to senior level, and I played senior football at the club as well. Oh, you played soccer? Uh, rugby, sorry. Uh, wrong, you, you, wrong, you, wrong use of term. So I played senior rugby down at the club. Uh, well, so, I mean, I, I always say for me, there's only two kinds of football. There's there's rugby football and there's American football. Mm -hmm. People refer <laughs> people refer to football, you know, like in the American sense, is like I don't – like people – you aren't intermixing the two. So – I mean, that's where, where the difference is. So you have like gridiron football, you have association football, you have yeah. rugby football, and then there's Australian rules football. And it's like, just, just call one each, but I've never, so where you're from, you just call rugby football. That's cool. I like that. I'm about that. Yeah, I think for me, it's just a, it's, it's a force of habit of spending too much time with Aussies and Kiwis uh, over the years. So you know, that, that's what they genuinely learn. Rugby as is football, and yeah, it's just a slip of the tongue. So, Well, good to go. Uh, I'm all about that. So, um, Did you play any other sports growing up in the UK? Yeah, I played soccer, uh, cricket. Uh, I was, you know, my, my parents encouraged me to play as many sports as possible, um, and it's something that I've encouraged any sort of youth uh, youth sports men and women that I come across is that, that you know, they play the most amount of sports. So I just think it gives you the best – foundation to, to hand-eye coordination, things that you can go out and enjoy um, and gives you a better sort of understanding of what your, your, your skill set a career in, uh, sorry, a career in sport um, by playing as much as possible at all different varieties when you're a kid. It's, it gives you a good foundation. So do you and Sir Richie play pick-up games of cricket? Did I again? <laughs> Well, Richie McCall was like a, uh, you know, uh, an age grade cricket player for New Zealand before he committed to rugby full time. So I, th I think you find, you know, you find quite a lot of, uh, of athletes and, and guys that have played professional sport of any, any kind, men and women, you know, quite a lot of the women, uh, female superstars of the, of the sevens game now have all played netball or some other sport. Quite a lot of top sportsmen. If you go and speak to them, rugby and, and soccer and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, they'll have played some other sport uh, growing up, and I think that you know helps them in terms of their development when they're a kid you know, to be a fantastic athlete or sportsman. Or woman. How would you describe the school system when it comes to how rugby works in the UK? Is it you know you have schoolboy rugby versus I guess club rugby? How do they integrate? Uh, I think. In all honesty, now um, it's a very, very, very overly saturated market. There's a lot of demands on the kids back in the UK to, to go and play uh, a lot of rugby um, because they're playing at the school and then there's the demands of that and, the, and the, especially the Penn's, um, private schools. There's a lot of development at SNC. So you're getting 18-year-old kids coming out of school and they're, they're bigger than most guys that are professionals and they've got full-time s &C programs there as well as the rugby being full-time being taken very seriously um and then you come away from that and you've got the state school system uh, and you've got some fantastic athletes who aren't necessarily getting that uh, strength and conditioning exposure um in the uk but you have some fantastic athletes that could go on to play the sport at a high level so there's a real saturated market in terms of 
kids that are playing rugby in the UK. Um, and and the opportunities are certainly there. It just depends on what catchment area you're in, be it aligned to a, an, an academy or a, a professional rugby system, or whether you have to go the old school route of playing for your club and, and coming that way through. So I think there is more opportunities than anywhere in the world for people to play rugby in the UK, just purely for the amount of schools that are playing it, the amount of competitions, the seven, the development of sevens over there and, and the sheer numbers number of junior clubs. So how would you describe your journey in professional rugby? Uh, checkered at times. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I was one of the lucky kids that, that came from an area that was at, the, at that particular time a rugby hotbed. Uh, Maidenhead had probably one of the largest junior sections in the country. Um, and uh, you know, I, I went through the through the system there. Um, I left left school early. Uh, but the school I was at was a uh, was a sporting school, um, and I sort of probably lent more towards that than staying in the classroom. Um, and I was, uh, you know, given the opportunity to go to Harlequins at a very young age. Um, but I was out of school at that time, and there were some guys that were there who were still in school and would come in uh, on a semi regular basis. And I was one of the ones that was there regularly because. It was the opportunity that was in front of me as a 17 year old. So you played senior rugby starting with Newbury. Um, how I, many teams? I, my, my senior rugby started when I was at Maidenhead. And, uh, and oh, then, really? Yeah. Okay. Then, I to, um, uh, then I went on to Harlequins. Uh, so I left Maidenhead and went on to Harlequins. So you were, you were playing senior rugby as like 16 year old? Yeah, basically. Um, you know, oh, I was, so I, how often does that happen? I college. Um, so I left. I left school and gone to college, um, and it was. I basically. I'm a boat builder by trade, so I was given the opportunity to go and uh, to, to play professional rugby, or I was going to go off and, and continue that. Um, and I thought, well, I'll try rugby, and if it goes and, and it works out for me, then I'll see how far I can get. Uh, if not, I've always got my trade to to fall back on and. What we now some 16 years later, and I'm in in San Diego coaching still. So uh, you know the, the building career has to go on hold for a bit longer. <laughs> so um, at Newbury, like how would you? How many teams in National One are really trying to get to the championship and be professional? Well, back back then it was it, it was all change. Uh, you know you, you can't so I mean, going back probably over 10 or 12 years now to when I was playing at Newbury. And um, back then it was, it was a different market. Um, there was a lot more, a lot, you know, it, we hadn't had the recession yet in the UK. So sponsorship was easier for some of the small clubs to pick up, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Harlequins the year before, and they got relegated down into our into international one, uh, as it was then, which is now the championship. Um, and it's gone through different, um, uh, different types of setup over the years. Back then, it went to um, promotion and relegation. So, if you were in top top team, you went back up, which is what it's now come back to. They went to an eight team playoff system. They went to a four team playoff system with home and away. So, for those teams in that at that level, really at that time, there was probably only three or four sides that were really gunning for promotion into the premiership because they were the only ones that could facilitate the needs and the requirements to play in the premiership. Um, and at the time, Newbury had the foundation uh, and they had the stand that they could build and develop if they got close to it. Um, you know, and, and that was sort of what Ben Ryan was striving for. He got the team for the championship uh, back then. And I, and I came in from Quinn's uh, in the Premiership to to be part of that squad and and try and sort of make Newbury sustainable in the Championship. You know that time with uh, you know Newbury, you then moved on to Cornish Pirates. Uh, yeah. you, you played a lot with them during that three year period. So, you know Newbury to Cornwall. What what was you know that experience like? Uh, you know, and Cornish Pirates are. They're a lot more ambitious now. It seems like uh, it looks like well, back, there's going to be a stadium built. Yeah, well, back then the stadium was being talked about. I mean, that was the reason why I left Newbury and went to there because you know Newbury were going to be a, a mid to mid to bottom table team, um, and Cornish Pirates that year I think finished second or third, um, and you know I was 
given an opportunity to go there. And as a young lad that I was back then, um, you know, you want to play at the highest level and uh, uh, possible. And, and that was the opportunity that was given to me to go and play for the Pirates um, by Dickie Evans, who's the owner down there. And he's he's the main guy behind the stadium for Corbyn that's been pushed for so many years. And, it, and it's fantastic that they've now got it because it's going to change not only rugby down there in terms of the opportunity to have a premiership team, but it gives people jobs and, and it makes, you know, that sort of, I suppose that bottom left-hand corner of the UK, if you like, far more um, accessible for people to, to go down there and live and get better jobs. So it's it's, it's not just a, a rugby thing that going in, it is, it's a really big thing for the county and for everybody in Cornwall. And it's fantastic that Dickie, Dickie hasn't, you know, taken his eye off it and, he, and he's kept kept persevering and persevering and there's a lot more people that have you know put weight behind it than just him but it's fantastic for the area that's going to have a potential opportunity to have a, a premiership rugby team you broke into england sevens in 2008 did that put your 15th career on delay no not at all really i, I was still playing sevens uh and sorry playing 15s whilst i was playing sevens i was at pirates at the time um, I'd been playing sevens for years, even before I went to to, to Harlequins and, and to Newbury. Um, I, I was playing sevens in the summer for invitational teams such as the White Hart Marauders, for Samurai, um, for uh, for another side for the Apache back there, which are they're all sort of invitational teams, and it was a good way of keeping fit in the summer. Um, I'd been involved in the Young England side, which Mike Friday, who uh, coaches US uh, US sevens was part of, and that was part of a development pathway. So sevens had always kind of been alongside my 15s career, and um, it just so happened that in I I got given the opportunity um, to be to, to get capped, and I'd been part of the squad that season alongside my 15s commitment. So I think you know we're we're now in a different time. This is back in 2007, 2008, maybe 10 years ago, where uh, you weren't it was the game was very very physical and very demanding, but we didn't know so much about the demands and what the body was being put under. So you would just quite happily get on with it. You know, you wanted to play rugby as much as possible. And, you know, I think you would have played 30 to 40 games plus in a season back then and not thought anything of it and then gone and played 10 or 12 sevens tournaments in the summer. So, you know, look at player welfare. It probably wasn't the best thing, but we didn't know any better. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was good fun. So 2008 to the other, oh, wow, 2008 to 2009, you, you were with Exeter. How would you describe Exeter? Uh, Exeter's another fantastic club. Um, I, uh, I mean, that, that, that year I spent a lot of time away with the Sevens because we had a World Cup. Um, but they're both, both Cornish Pirates and, and Exeter are fantastic clubs in terms of what they build. I had a couple of the best years I ever had were down at Cornish Pirates in terms of my enjoyment of rugby. Um, and in Exeter, there was always, you could see they were always going to become a premiership team. Once Tony Rowe had built the stadium and that foundation had been set, it was only a matter of time, really, as to when they'd get promoted. It wasn't a, a question of if and maybe. It was, you know, it was when, when is this going to happen? Um, because of the fantastic foundations that they, they laid down and, and the commitment that was made by him and um, him and Rob Baxter and all the other guys that have been, been behind it there. So, you know, that, that part of the world is rugby through and through um southwest of england you know rugby is the main sport not soccer or or anything else so you go down there and and, and everybody lives and breathes it so it's it's fantastic because you get the you get the support but also it gives it gives a lot back to the community so x has really been a shining light for that down there um and, and that's why i think it's fantastic that pirates are for this stadium as well because that really is a, a hotbed of rugby for for, for for, for England. So you then played at Bath. Uh, I think it was, I think I saw only four games. Like, why was that so short? What happened? Um, I left Exeter to go to Bath. Um, and I basically, uh, during, during the season, um, I was, uh, I was you know, playing or involved in the squad. Um, and then they signed Luke Watson, who was always coming in. Uh, and he turned up. Sort of just going into Christmas time, um, the the opportunity then arose for me to go to Worcester for the rest of the season. They had an injury crisis, so a lot you see it a lot in in soccer. People transfer uh, midway through a season because they're not being used or whatever, and that was just the case for me. I was behind 
you know, a, an international uh, loose forward in Luke. Um, at, he came to go to Worcester. So, you know, again, you know, I, I just wanted to play rugby and, 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 and develop and be the best version I could of myself at the time. And, and that was the opportunity that presented itself at Worcester. So go to Worcester, um, play 10 games, you know, I understand controversy surrounding that you, you had a suspension, uh, following that. Um, but you, you look at Wooster now, just on the outside looking in, are they in the same place as they were eight years ago? Basically, um, either just treading water in the premiership or just trying to get promoted again because they don't seem to. Uh, I, I think that would have been a fair assessment a couple of years ago, um, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but Gary Gold came in a couple of years ago and, and really changed everything at the club. And then he's obviously left and now come here. But with that, um, uh, with that he's brought in Alan Solomons. And so, you know, what Gary's done in terms of changing the club around and developing them on the right pathway, they are now a much more sustainable team. I mean, some of their score lines this year are, are scores that have not um, regularly uh, created in, in the Premiership. So now they're starting to develop and win games regularly. They're getting a run of two, three, four games. They're knocking off bigger teams. You know, and when I was there, you know, we were fighting for our lives week in, week out, and unfortunately we got relegated that season. Um, you know, and it was it was a tough, tough uh, seven months or whatever it was I was at the club. I don't know it's less than that, but you know the the club has certainly developed in that time. Um, and having guys like Gary and now Alan come in have developed the club into into you know starting to take strides forward. And um, you know I'm not I know that the you know the Premiership is a pretty ruthless league, uh, and there's a lot of clubs that have faltered this year. Um, but Worcester have certainly finished on a high, and and team seem to be taking steps in the right direction. For them, it will now be about recruitment over the summer, players that they're bringing in. And making sure that they're they're on the front foot going into next season and don't just rest on the fact that they had a good end to you. So you know, in 2010, you you become the guy uh, it, for England Sevens. You were like the first full time contracted guy. Uh, you follow your old coach from Newbury, Ben Ryan, to play for him. Mm -hmm. So how did you know? How did that happen? Uh, I, basically, with I suppose the cloud that uh, my 15s career ended under at Worcester, um, I, I was, you know, I, I had an option basically. My option was uh, to go and play overseas um, to continue my 15s career. Um, or uh, at that time, there was the Commonwealth Games. Uh, I'd been, been involved a little bit that year with England Sevens in between uh, playing for Worcester and for Bath. Um, and the Olympic inclusion had been, had been given the green light. Uh, post Dubai in 2009 um, and so the choice was I either go overseas and, and try and resurrect my 15s career or I could go to Commonwealth Games um, you know I could go to potentially Olympia I could go to a world I could go to another World Cup um, and and I got the opportunity to work with Ben again and Ben rang me up and was like look we want to offer full-time sevens contracts um, we want to give we give one to you what do you think and for me it was a no-brainer because you know, I've, I've worked with Ben for years and I loved Sevens and it almost felt like everything that happened at Worcester happened for a reason and that was, you know, to go down the path of, of playing Sevens and I, I love my time on the Sevens and I love travelling, I love going and experiencing different cultures and, you know, the whole sort of world, the crazy sort of circus that comes with it um, and the opportunity to go to Commonwealth Games and potentially an Olympics was, was a big thing for me. Uh, you know, I grew up um, watching the Olympics on TV as a, as a kid and it just kind of I suppose set off this dream of, of having the opportunity to go to a major uh, sporting event such as that um, and and that, and that was you know, it was it was as simple as that really because of those sort of, uh, two opportunities to go to those major events and, and compete for my country is everyone in England sevens on full-time contracts now they are yes yeah I think there's around uh, probably 20, 22 guys that are on full-time contracts. So when you started, you know, full-time sevens, you started coaching around this time, I think. Did you, yeah, you return to Maidenhead, I, right? I, I spent most of my rugby career coaching alongside. I've got 
um, good links with my with place I went to school. Um, so I'd often go back and help coach uh, some friends that had then gone on to, to take up um, schooling, uh, sort of teaching jobs. Um, so I'd always go back and help them out. So I was, and I helped coach a couple of my old clubs. So I'd go back to Maidenhead um, and coach down there and a couple of other local clubs I'd go in. So I'd sort of started that coaching, um, sort of not career as such, but I'd started gaining experience as a coach. Um, and then when I went into the, the full-time sort of squad with England, uh, the women's team at that time were being run um, along, along not, they were sort of being run part-time, but they were part of the World Series that was being developed um, and they had a few tournaments throughout the year and then there was World Cups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that kind of forged uh, a sort of pathway for me to develop my coaching career um, in a more, I suppose, pressure cooker environment that is international rugby um, and and also gain a different experience from the women and how you deliver and, and how you conduct yourself and, and talk to talk to players and, and making sure that you're getting the right message across and the different challenges that come with that. Um, and that's that's sort of how it all started, really, um, because unbeknownst to me, you know, your injuries start to come in when you're when you get older, and the opportunity to coach became more and more prominent. Um, so I helped do some, some talent ID work and set up a, a talent ID program for the RFU with, um, with the guidance of, of Barry Maddox, who was the women's head coach then. Um, and, and we've developed a few young players that came through that are now playing for. England women on the on the World Series. Debs Fleming being one of the sort of most notable girls that came out of that as a as a talent ID athlete from netball and athletics. So, you know, Russia, twenty thirteen Rugby World Cup sevens. Yeah, uh, you played and then had to like skitter over and coach. You know, women sevens. Like how how did that like work out at you know at that level of tournament because their schedule like throughout the year is different from the men's side. That all that, that year was the uh, the year that I, I actually first picked picked up my first major injury. So in the beginning of the year in the Gold Coast, um, I did my knee um, and had to have a knee reconstruction. So I'd spent the majority of the season coaching the girls um during during the weekend so we train monday to friday and then saturday and sunday the girls would come into camp um and that was sort of my week if you like it was a seven day week um i was also helping ben do some things with the forwards um with with the senior squad so because i was injured i used it as an opportunity to do the best i could to help um and, and use the experience that i had from playing to, to help the girls and uh, and to help the sort of men's team. So that year was more of a coaching year than a playing year. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, one of those things, sevens for me was always, and, and always will be a, a passion. Um, and I enjoyed sort of flipping between the two. And, and I suppose not having the pressures of being a head coach or anything like that. I was consultant coach. You know, you just, you could easily go in and just give a few pointers and work on small things. And you didn't necessarily have to look at the whole, big picture it was a sort of opportunity to do a bit of troubleshooting if there was anything that needed looking at in a specific manner so it wasn't you know it, it seemed like a big task but it really wasn't because it was you know you could focus on small little parts to make uh, make improvements where they were needed so when you finish with england you followed ben ryan um to fiji as an assistant to him and then you took over fijiana yeah how did how did all of that happen uh, so I, I I had to retire basically. I did my knee again for the second time, um, and it, it was just an unfortunate thing, but something that comes to every rugby player. Um, and at the time, I was living in London doing my uh, doing my rehab, um, which again is a pretty odious task. And Ben called me up and was like, "Look, I haven't got an assistant over here, um, and you know we've worked together as." as player and coach and we've coached co-coached alongside each other a little bit with England um I need somebody to help me with the forwards uh, and some defensive stuff and potentially look at defense and just just help me out and you know sort of be an eye in the sky for him um so I moved out there I remember what it was now it was early on in the 2014-15 season 
um, and and, I, and over I went to Fiji with a with a rucksack and and, a, and my passport and came back I think six months later whatever it was to the UK to uh, to round up the World Series in, in, in London and I had a another a year of, sort of experience under my belt as a, as an assistant coach to Ben um, and then we were moving into the to the Olympic year as you like uh, and the Fijiana hadn't qualified for the World Series so to to basically get paid um, and the opportunity arose to have a full-time role with the women and that would be my my, my, my role my paid role um, but continue my my job as the assistant coach so I ended up with a dual dual job if you like my first six months in Fiji was actually unpaid um, because it was the opportunity to gain a fantastic work experience but also um, to, to help them out over there so you know it was um, it was a, again one of those things are kind of like you know is this going to be possible because it was it was a step up but having experienced working across both programs before with england there wasn't a problem in being able to balance balance both of them if you know what i mean um yeah um and and the athletes that we got to work with in fiji and the girls and the, and the boys it was you know, really really exciting uh exciting time and to, and to get to work with that group of women um who really really had to kind of work for everything to, to get uh, all the support that they needed uh, was fantastic opportunity, and um, you know it's it's great to see they really sort of still kicking on each time they they take the field on the World Series. So, what what made you leave Fiji? Um, I went I went there with a with a job to do, and that was you know to, to do the best that we could for the Fijiana. Um, they had never been full time, uh, and so when we started the program in October before so what's that eight months out from the olympics nine months out from the olympics um it was get them qualified and we did that tick that box they got qualified uh did the best we could in the world series to develop the olympics uh, key message you know in terms of my job whilst i was there was to to win the olympics with the men and and to try and win another world series um so when we got to the end of that year and we were in the olympic village myself and ben it was a case of well you know do we continue this journey or if we're successful, is that the end of the journey? Um, and I followed Ben out there um, and, you know, both of us decided, uh, you know, in, the, in this sort of, um, in the aftermath, if you like, of, of Rio, that the best thing for us to do was, was to move on and to, to go and take up new challenges. And, and for, for the both of us, it was a fantastic a uh, fantastic journey over there I and mean, such a memorable experience um, in terms of every everything not just rugby but life um, and everything that happened over there uh, was was incredible and it was always been a deep deep memory for me but it was time to move on to the next thing and uh, and the next opportunities that were out there and um, and it, it just felt like it was the right time to me so before we get to right now hmm. what happened in between leaving Fiji and taking this job? Uh, well, I moved, moved back to the UK. Um, sort of, uh, I, I took a bit of time out. I, I, I applied for a few other sevens roles. Um, and then really, to be honest with you, I wanted to get stuck, stuck into 15s. I wanted to challenge myself in a different environment. Um, I ended up doing some consultancy work over in China, uh, trying to help, help them set up their sevens program, and they've recently just qualified for the uh, for the World Series. Um, uh, so it was kind of a year of, if you like, finding finding my feet, finding where I wanted to go next in terms of the sort of next steps of my career, um, and I wanted to challenge myself in a different environment. You know, Ben, who I'd worked alongside so long was going off on his his other path and like i say the fiji thing had come to an end and we both decided that was the right time to move on um so it just took a bit of time really to kind of find the right thing and the right opportunity uh and that's you know where san diego and and, and the opportunity here came along through matt hawkins and and the guys there so i'm guessing you know matt from playing against him on the series just a little bit <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, what was the decision point to come to San Diego? For me, um, it was the day he rung me up about Christmas time and said, mate, get on a plane and 
and and come out. Um, you know, this is what the the job is. This is what we want you to do. Um, you're going to be working alongside Rob, well, underneath Rob Hoadley and alongside Zach Test. Um, Zach and myself know each other really, really well from the circuit. Um, and I know Rob from the UK, uh, and played against him, um, and also played with his brother. So for me, it was, you know, the opportunity too good to, to turn down. Um, it was to come and live in a fantastic part of the world, um, work with an incredibly exciting opportunity in terms of building this rugby club and, and, and building part of, part of the MLR and the vision that goes with that. Uh, and it, it, for me, it was the right opportunity, exactly what I was looking for when I left Fiji, was to come and be a part of something exciting and new. And, uh, and, it, and this has certainly been that ever since I've been here. So you're the forwards coach. What is your philosophy with scrumming and the set piece offense? Um, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> well, you're supposed to give away more than Rob did because I, I don't need to spend too much analyzing. I mean, that's what I do every game. I just analyze the, in, yeah. the entire thing. But, I mean, if I know what you're going to do, it makes it easier to analyze. Yeah, I'd love to give away a lot, but I can't. Um, you know, it's, rugby is um, a fantastic game of all sort of shapes and sizes. So, you know, at the moment, you know, going around to what we're doing, we're, we just want to develop the players and the guys as best we can each time we get to the opportunity to train. You know, we've got guys like Tony Papua and Dolph Botha who obviously got a world of experience. Um, and underneath that, we've got some guys that are, are converting from, from other sports. So um, in terms of, philosophy if you like and at the moment i just want to develop those guys to be the best rugby players that they can uh, for each time that they take the field and represent the legion so this is where the, the the tough question so well maybe not so stylistically hmm. the pack what are you trying to have them do stylistically not the not your not your attack, because you already told me you're you're not giving me that. But there's a little bit more to like nuance of how you know the boys get after it. How, how do you mean get after it? Well, I mean, so you have different your your scrum does different things other than you know like your your attack. Like, how do they? What is the style you want? from them because we we look at i guess it, southern it, hemisphere we look at irish we look at english you know all that stuff each scrum and line out is to provide you know um a good set piece and, and, and a foundation for your attack so you know it's i don't think it's any uh any secret that any team wants to have that solid foundation Well, to provide week in week out is a solid solid foundation for for our attack to thrive and for Zach's uh, for Zach's backs to be unleashed in, in in attack. So, you know, defensively you want to disrupt, and I think that's any team, whether it's us, whether it's Houston, whether it's Austin, they're going to want to disrupt up front and and not allow a team to get on the get good quality ball to launch their attack. So, you know, this is where it gets tough. For it could be tough. It depends on your answer. So I've watched a lot of your guys' film, and so so have others, and people have been fairly critical of like how you guys have been scrumming to yeah. date. Um, this Saturday, uh, you got. I think you guys improved a lot. Um, yep. um, I think you in the. I, I would say in the first preseason match I watched, there was definitely up front there were you know, technical differences between your guys and Austin there mm. was. And then we saw last week a significant like difference. Whereas what has been the adjustment to fix the problems you've seen in analysis? Well, the, the adjustments are that we're developing. As I said to you at the top of the top of the podcast each week, as a coach, you want to help player develop and you want the player to improve. And you want to make those incremental uh, improvements week in, week out. And at the moment, you know, that's that's what we're striving to do. Another game, another tough game against Houston on Friday night. Um, and we improved, improved from Seattle and, and we took steps forward into the game yesterday. 
Uh, and that's what we want to do this week is just to make sure that we're improving each time we take the field. And, uh, and the guys, you know, working hard today was a recovery day for them. And, and tomorrow they're back in and, in the, in, in making those steps forward. And for me as a coach is to make sure that I'm, you know, we're not replicating the mistakes that we're making um, and we're learning where we're making those mistakes and we're moving forward in our, in our practice and our craft each time we get an opportunity to play. So how do you guys adjust um, practice uh, time and, uh, I guess, repetitions? Because you just said they have the day off today and then you have a short week. You played on Sunday and now you play again on Friday. So how do you mitigate uh there's, you know there's all there's always uh there's always one, more than one way to skin a cat so you know it doesn't necessarily have to be on the field there's film uh you know there's there's there's, there's low intensity work that the guys can be doing um you know they can be self-analyzing they can be working together they can work as a group uh you know there's there's all sorts of manner of of ways of getting around development um, and developing, developing the person, not just developing us as a, as a side. Because if we develop each individual, you know, then the squad has a better outcome uh, and a better group moving forward. So, in terms of the short turnaround and week, you know, we're we're, we're working on some technical things uh, as we do every week. But we might then lower the load in terms of time out on the paddock or time hitting the scrum machine or you know time doing live scrums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever it may be, whichever way we want to structure the week. Um, we just make sure we get that balance right so that the boys are ready to go again on Friday, but have improved as much as they can in the five days that we've got to get them right. So I see you've got a Sunto on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I run around with one of them GPS watches. What, what, what are you using yours for? Me? Um, I use it to keep the boys in check. <laughs> uh, no, I've... Um, you know, I've, I've, one of the reasons for moving to a place like this for me is I love being outdoors. So there's some amazing hikes to go on here. I, you know, I can surf, I can run, I can go on the beach. So for me, it's uh, as, as much as a tool for work as it is for my own personal kind of you know, health and well-being. So uh, you know, I use it to time the boys, whether it be a scrum session, whether it be a drill or a practice that we're doing. It's, it's a multiple multiple use tool, if you like. <laughs> So, what's your favorite part of San Diego? Yeah, I saw that on the questions when you sent them over. Um, I first came here in 2008, I think it was, on the sevens, um, and it's changed dramatically. Right, it's changed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I, it's I always, always loved it as a city. I thought it was great back then. Um, not that my memory was too clear from the night out in the Gasland district, but um, it's... I, t I suppose it's one of those answers. You f if you ask me that 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever it is, we've had a completely different answer. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, Carlsbad and Encinitas and the, the village kind of vibe down down by the ocean. Um, I'm very, very lucky that I live in, in Del Mar um, and really enjoying this area. Uh, the beach here is beautiful. And like I say, I like to surf and get out in the ocean. So uh, I can drive you know, the other side of the five and, and, and get in the surf. Uh, when I have some spare time, and you know, I think to be honest with you, I'm I'm just enjoying exploring all of it at the moment. Uh, I wouldn't say I can hang my hat on one place that's my favourite, but I'm lucky. I live in I live in Del Mar, and it's an incredible place to live, and I've experienced as much of it as I can uh, when I can. And uh, you know, San Diego is just a great place to to live in the world, and I've seen plenty of the of the globe, and this is definitely one of the best spots I've been to. Are you sure it wasn't for the horse racing? <laughs> uh, I've been told about the season, but I haven't yet to see it. So, you know, I'll that question in six months when I've got through the summer, and uh, and, I, and I might I might have a different answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, that's all I got. Well, Chris, um, great to have you on. Uh, and everyone else, we are live again for the show at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Lots to talk about. San Diego made us eat some crow, so we're going to eat the crow, and uh, then we'll preview next week's matches. Um, Brilliant.